question. What's up? Is there someone that's cleaning the lamp on the projectors? Um, I think our IT guy usually usually does. Yeah. What's up? I just saw the orange flashing light on it. Oh really? Okay. I will I will let our IT guy know. Yeah, I mean, let me leave it up for myself. Trying to be no one's. That's love. 
I want it, I want the yeah, I want the model as well. So yeah, okay, thank you. Thank <laughs> you. See that going outside here. Yeah, I don't think calculations are right. Yeah. I'm doing like shock loads for the tendons on the retaining ring. Oh, so he's very useful. And I was like, no, I don't know if I'm doing this right. Like, I don't know if I'm doing this right. I don't know if I'm doing this when you always ask you to check it out. I just said, I'll ask you guys Okay. Sorry. I lost my ED. I don't know if you can tell it's devastating me. I know. Like, I, I, I saw you watch that walking up in the elevator, and like your hair was not in the usual place. It's a little bit like sad. Oh, yeah. And I was like, man, Amara looks like he's been through just, I lost the cube, and then I walked everywhere. <laughs> I lost my cube grant. Oh, really? Wait, oh, there's one on the table. Huh? There's one on the box. Is that no one's cube? I don't know. If it's not been finished, like, yeah, it's not faced. If it's not faced at all, it's my cube. <laughs> Come on. I like my cube. Sure, I, no, I, I don't know how to make capture. <laughs> yeah, we can learn how to do it together. But a bar is and don't, yeah. don't, don't let it receive it, you know. Mm -hmm. you just lost everything you have to do. Oh, I want to be able to do it. No, you don't know. You're right. I don't know. All I know is I need Chuck's tacos. I don't know who Chuck is. I just want their tacos. They're not even good, bro. They're not good. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I was about to say pants or something. I was like, that's a weird thing. I love you, 
I would turn away from the bottom. It's more to it. All right, it's uh, 5 30. Let's go and get started. All right, good afternoon, everyone. How's uh, how's everyone doing? Pretty okay. Um, I lost a few. Q. Oh, Q. A Q. Oh, well, I hope we find it. I hope so too. <laughs> All right. So today we have a we have a lecture day. Um, so um, it's, been, it's been a while since we've kind of done lecture lecture. Um, you know, we've been doing kind of answers activities, kind of you know, posting the head for a while. Um, but you know, before we do the next activity, so the next activity is is planned for next Thursday. Um, we kind of have to cover some uh, some new information. So the subject for today's lecture are um, what are called shell and beam elements. So um, these are special element types um, that uh, are really useful in some situations. So you know, we'll, we'll be going over that. Today. Okay, uh, so some announcements. And so hopefully everyone got my email. Uh, I think it was it was yesterday afternoon. Um, so the, the project, uh, the midterm project specifications were, uh, were posted. So I have three, three CAD models for you guys to choose from. Um, so I believe uh, one is a bracket. The other one is like a handle. Um, and the third one is this kind of large kind of pressurized fluid unit. Okay. Um, so you can choose any one of those three uh, to do your midterm project in. Okay. Uh, but everything else about the requirements and the report and stuff, all of that is the same, the same as what we talked about on Tuesday. Uh, but just, you know, make sure you go over it yourself and kind of, um, you know, familiarize yourself with the project. Okay. Um, as a reminder, you know, the project is due on Halloween. So that is uh, exactly four weeks from today. Um, so you do have quite a bit of time. Uh, remember, you know, I, I, I don't, you know, expect you, I, I don't expect the project to take that long. Um, you know, it's mostly just to give you guys enough runway to kind of kind of do it, just because I know you guys are really busy during this time. Um, but you know, don't don't leave it for the last you know the last eight hours before it's due to, to do it. Okay, um, you know, otherwise it's uh, not going to be a, a positive experience. Okay. All right. Any questions I can answer before we get started for today? Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and uh, get rolling. Okay, so the subject for today is shell and beams. Okay, so you know we've been spending the last couple of weeks talking about the different types of elements that you can choose in your mesh, right? Um, so we've gone over two D elements, three D elements triangles, rectangles, tetrahedrons, hexahedrons, right? Um, I would consider all of those to be kind of the basic element types. Uh, another name that they have are, are called the, the solid element types. And by the way, you know, we're, we're kind of, a, I'm kind of assuming that we're working in 3D at this point. So, you know, I know, I know we kind of started this class doing 2D analysis, but you know, from here on forward, we're, we're doing it 3D, okay? So the reason these are called solid element types is because they are a solid three-dimensional ball, okay? Now that might seem obvious, right? So if you're doing a three-dimensional analysis, you know, your geometry is gonna be in three dimensions. And so it makes sense that your elements are also gonna be in three dimensions, right? And you would be right. And so in most cases, those that would be, you know, that is an important characteristic, right? Um, you know, you can't really use trying, uh, you can't really use 2D triangles to mesh your 3D 
um, you know, bridge, right? Because your bridge is in three dimensions and your triangle is in two dimensions, right? So it makes sense that, you know, the element, the element types and the element shapes that we've gone over so far match the dimensionality of the analysis that we want to do, right? And in general, this, this, is, this is true, right? But there are some situations where it might be useful to use some more specialized element types. Uh, element types. Shell and beam elements are, are not the only special element types that you can do in, in um, you know, with, with your meshing, um, but they are by far the most useful. Okay, so let's 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 think of you know what are some situations where that might be useful, right? So the element types that we have, you know, they are three dimensional shapes, right? We have a three dimensional pyramid and a three dimensional brick, essentially, right? Um, what if you have a geometry that is not as you know three dimensional as a um, as those elements? Okay. So, for example, you know, what if we have a, a geometry that is very thin? Okay. okay. So the most uh, the most basic example of this. Uh, actually, an example that happens a lot um, in engineering is if you have a very thin plate. The plate may be very long and very wide in, 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 in two dimensions. Okay. But in, in the third dimension, in this case is the height, right? Uh, or I guess you could say the thickness of this plate, that height is much, much less than the other dimensions of the plate. So you have a very vast difference in scales here. We have some dimensions that are very big, and maybe some dimensions that are very, very small. Okay. Another example of a, of, a, of a geometry type where it might be useful to use a different element is maybe you have a very slender geometry. Very common case for this is maybe you have a very, very thin rod. Okay. Or the ugliest rod I've ever driven. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. So in the in, in the rod right here, you know, we have one dimension in this case that's much, much bigger than all the others, right? So the length. <clears throat> of a rod is much bigger than the other dimensions. Okay. Now, why is this relevant? Right. So, why, why, why am I bringing up these types of geometries with regards to the well, if you recall from earlier in the class, we, generally speaking, you know, our elements like to be non-skewed, right? And so when we make a, you know, tetrahedron, you know, ideally all the edge side, all sides of that tetrahedron should be roughly the same size, right? Same thing for a hexahedron, 
right? So for hexahedron, the most ideal shape for hexahedron would be a cube where all the sides are the same. So we want to make we want to make it so that our elements have basically the same same dimensions all 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 throughout. Okay, it's not the worst thing if you remember it's not the worst thing if you if you have a few skewed elements, but if the majority of your of your elements are skewed or distorted in a certain way, um, you know it's going to lead to to poor results. Okay, let me let me show you what that means for kind of a thin point. Okay, so if you have a, a thin plate like this, right? So one dimension is obviously going to be much smaller than the others, right? So normally, you know, if you see a geometry like this, you know, you may try to mesh it, um, you know, according to the two large dimensions. Right? So you may try to break it up something like this. So in purple here, I'm going to draw the mesh. Right, so your elements might look something like that. So if, if I were to kind of take out one of those elements, right, um, each of those elements would kind of be like a miniature version of that plate, right? So two of the dimensions of that element would be fairly large, and one uh, dimension of that element will be fairly small. So if I were to, you know, take this guy out like this, It would look something like like that. Not the ugliest hexahedron in the world, but um, you know it is one that's fairly squished. Where, you know, one dimension is much much smaller than, than the others. Okay, and you guys will appreciate this a bit more too now, now that we've kind of talked about shape functions and what they look like, right? Um, and so when you have one dimension here that's much less than the other ones, you know it kind of screws up a, a little bit kind of your uh, your approximations with your shape functions, right? Where in this case, you know, let's say the z direction is much smaller, right? You know, that's going to change how your shape function behaves um, just because you don't you just don't have a lot of room in, in that z direction okay okay so you know we can say that this element is is quite distorted again not the worst not the worst thing but uh you know definitely not ideal either okay so one thing you can do and kind of the first the first thought that people is that you know why don't we just make the elements small right so why don't we make them all cubes where each side of the cube is is the height of the plate itself right so why don't we kind of further divide this so we further divide this into smaller and smaller elements Eventually, we're going to reach a point where each element there is basically a cube. Doesn't have to be exactly a cube, but uh, pretty cube-like. So yes, technically that is possible, right? So it is possible for you to refine your mesh to a point where all of your elements kind of lose all their distortion and they become, you know, they become fine. The problem with this is that you know if you're if the difference in length scales in your geometry are fairly large, right? So let's say that you know this, for this plate, the length of the plate is you know maybe thirty times bigger than thickness. The width is like forty times bigger than thickness. Okay, you can refine it enough eventually so that your mesh is is well you know has has good quality elements. The problem there the problem there is that you know 
as we know, you know, the more elements that you include in a mesh, the more expensive it's, it's going to be. Okay. So oftentimes, you know, these are situations where refinement is not really practical. So you, you end up having to do a lot of work, you have to do a lot of computational um, time, you know, for really not all that much benefit, or, you know, it, it takes, it takes way too much work to kind of fix the problem. So oftentimes it's, it's, it's just not worth it, which is kind of a strange thing to say, right? So in a world where, you know, our, our, you know the availability of computing seems almost endless at this point, uh, you know, having a, having a problem where, you know, just by just that, that can be solved by just refining the mesh, you know, that seems like a very simple and elegant solution to this, but it, it can be very extreme. Or, you know, you might be simulating, you know, a very simple plate, um, but you know you may require forty million elements to do that, so that's that's probably not the best use of your uh, of your computational resources. Okay. okay, there's another problem with this as well. And so in these situations, you know, if you look at this mesh right here, you can look at either of them, right? Even in the best case scenario, I I, I have what's called uh, what I usually describe as you know one element through thickness. By the way, this, this next one is not an official metric. This is just my own kind of, um, you know, we're just, just kind of based on my own experience simulating just, you know, hundreds of, of these kinds of things, okay? So what tends to happen when you only have one element through thickness is that it can, this can kind of throw off your, your results in, in, a, in a very interesting way. Because when you have only one element through the thickness, right? If I, if you look at uh, the majority of the nodes here, and so if we assume, you know, let's assume for a second that we just have a linear, um, you know, a linear element, right? And so for a linear element, um, you know, we only have um, nodes that are on the vertices of the, of the shape, right? All of the vertices or all of the nodes of that element are sitting on the boundary of the domain. Okay. Now, this is kind of a, a dangerous situation too, because you know, when all of your nodes are sitting on the boundary of the domain, right? What do we know the, of, of what happens at the boundaries? Or what, ha what happens often at the boundaries? The boundaries are often where we apply boundary conditions. And even in cases or even in surfaces where we don't apply, uh, we don't explicitly apply a boundary condition, you know, there's still a default boundary condition that, that's applied there just because it's mathematically required. So the thing about the nodes that are sitting on the boundary, their solution is often strongly influenced, if not completely influenced, by the boundary condition that's set there. which, you know, by itself is, is not a bad thing, right? And so that's that's the reason we apply the boundary conditions is to, is to influence those um, those nodes, right? But if, you, if your element and if your mesh is in a certain way where every single node of that element is, is basically determined by the boundary conditions, 
you know, at that point, you're not really solving any equations. And so you're basically just following with whatever the boundary conditions tell you. And so in order to have kind of a true kind of solution, um, you know, it helps a lot to have what I call interior nodes. So you want to have nodes that are kind of in the interior of your, of your domain. So interior nodes are, are the nodes that aren't sitting on the boundary conditions. And so, you know, they, their values are going to be determined purely based on the equations, okay? Now, having quadratic elements helps. Um, having quadratic elements helps a lot, because remember, you know, in quadratic elements, we added all of those mid nodes. And so just by naturally having quadratic elements, you're going to have some interior nodes based on that. But, uh, you know, you, want, you often want to have more than one element through the thickness, okay? Okay, so let's kind of zoom out here and see. Okay, so the issue that we're running into is that you know we have a geometry that's naturally very thin, right? In order to get elements that are non-distorted, we have to refine our mesh, you know, pretty strong, pretty severely in order, in order to get you know good quality elements. Okay, but even if we do get good quality elements, we still have this issue of you know. We just don't really have that many interior nodes, okay? And so to create more interior nodes, the solution to that is just to refine it even further, right? And so one thing you can do, you can just keep refining, right? Uh, eventually, you're going to reach a point where, you know, you have enough interior nodes, your elements are all beautiful, and you can solve your solution. But usually at that point, you know, your mesh is at, you know, probably 100 million elements, all for just a very simple plate. And your manager's gonna look at you like, what are you like? What are we doing here, man? Why do we need so many elements for just a simple geometry? It gets out of control very, very quickly. So there has to be a better way to do this, right? So there, there has to be, you know, a way for us to get a good quality mesh that's gonna give us a good quality solution you know, without having to, you know, break the bank on, on our computation resources. Okay? And that solution is to use a different element type. A big reason we're kind of in this mess is because, you know, we, we're using elements that have a solid shape, right? Hexahedrals that have to have a wall. But for a geometry here that's incredibly thin, you know, it maybe it doesn't really make sense to try to mesh it with a, with a, with, you know, with a brick type element. It's almost like trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. Uh, now, I've seen the meme. I know you can put square pegs into a round hole if the hole is big enough, but, um, but you know, this is, not, this is not that case, right? So we want to fit a square peg into a square hole. And so what if, what if the element that we are choosing is also very thin or also very slender? All right. So, what's the thinnest? What's the thinnest type of a uh, of uh, of uh, you know geometry that you can think of? It's a two D shape, right? So, a two D rectangle, a two D triangle is is something that is very very thin. Kind of the assumption is that when you have a two D shape, is that the thickness of that two D shape is basically infinitesimally small. 
And then for slender geometries, slender geometries have one dimension that's much bigger than the others. We can say that 1D shapes are very slender. And so, of course, you know, these elements types have a name. And so the 2D shapes, these are called shell elements. And 1D shapes are called beam elements. Okay. So instead of trying to mesh your very thin geometry with a, with a brick, you know, you're basically going to be meshing it with a basically like a piece of paper. And so it looks something like this. And so if you have a kind of geometry that looks like this, then and so when we transform this into a shell element, we're basically turning it into a 2D geometry. And then we're essentially going to mesh it with two dimensional shapes. And this arrangement on the right, where we use shell elements, shell rectangular elements, this is going to be much, much more efficient than trying to use 3D solid elements. And so since we're no longer kind of burdened by that thickness dimension, you know, we're kind of free to kind of choose our element size, you know, much, much more efficiently in this case. And so you can basically create a mesh on that geometry without having to worry about distortion, uh, without having to worry about elements with the thickness, because now there is no thickness, um, you know, using, using these shell elements. So you, you're kind of killing, you know, you know, like three birds with, with one stone. So it's a very, very, very efficient stone that you're throwing at birds under pollution. All right, any questions on, on this so far? Okay, good. All right, so that seems great. That seems magical, right? But you might be thinking, you know, wait a minute, you know, we're not doing a 2D analysis, we're doing a 3D analysis, right? So how, how can we use a 2D shape to approximate three-dimensional behavior? So notice how I didn't call these 2D elements, right? So all the triangles and the rectangles that we covered, you know, I think it was last week, you know, those are strictly 2D elements, right? These aren't 2D elements, these are shell elements, okay? So shell elements and, and beam elements okay? Shell and beam elements are, are special element types that are augmented in a way where they can do, where they can basically simulate out of plane behavior. And so by out of plane behavior, I mean basically the Z direction for shells and then for beams, it's you know the Y and the Z direction. Okay. Let me kind of illustrate this to you. So for a traditional 2D element, let me let me just draw a 2D triangle for you. Okay, so if this were just a traditional 2D triangle. If you remember the, the shape function that we um, that we computed using this only had X and Y. That was our shape function. There were three, three nodes and three turns, right? And so the traditional 2D triangle can only handle behavior in the, you know, in the in the x and y direction. 
the shape function the shape function for a shell element is augmented and so you can actually capture behavior that goes in the z direction And so what a, what a shell element can do that a traditional 2D element cannot is that it can actually bend out of plane, okay? And so for a traditional 2D element, you know, if this were kind of a traditional 2D element, it would be stuck within this plane, right? But for a shell element, and this is kind of really, really hard to draw, right? So for a shell element, you know, if, if this were kind of the plane, right? And we're gonna draw this triangle right here, right? The shell element can actually come out of the plane. So what I mean by that is, you know, maybe you're applying a moment in that direction, right? The shell element, the shell element can actually bend, you know, so that it's it's, coming, it's kind of coming off the page. I know that's a terrible drawing, but you know, hopefully, hopefully, my 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 voice and my um, um, you know spoken explanation uh, helps to uh, helps to illustrate that. But I know I know that's terrible. I'm trying to draw a three dimensional thing on a two dimensional iPad. You know, there's limitations to the tool. Right? Okay, so how did they do this? And so a shell element, uh, well, let me start with the 2D triangle. So the traditional 2D triangle traditionally only computes deformations in X and Y direction, okay? So a shell element can compute deformations in X, Y, and Z. So the shell element is basically augmented with extra nodes so that it can, it can actually do that, right? So there's enough there's enough nodes there to support that those degrees of freedom. Okay. And another thing that shell elements can do is that they can also compute rotations um, uh, on all three axes. So a rotation is basically basically the orientation of that shell element in that in that uh, in that uh, in that part. Okay, it's 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 almost it's very similar to how the strain is computed. So the rotation is basically the is is the derivative of the deformation in a certain direction. Okay, so the rotation is is very similar to strain itself. Okay, so you know for a if you compare you know element to element right. A shell element is computing a lot more per element than a traditional triangle. So, you know, on a per element basis, shell elements are going to be more expensive. And that's even true for the solid elements too. So even compared to the tetrahedron and hexahedrons, right? So your tetrahedron and tetrahedrons are, are, are only computing just traditional deformations, okay? But because your, your shell element, it, it can compute things in, uh, in the out of plane motion, but it technically doesn't have any nodes in that direction. Uh, and so in order to compensate for that, it has to compute kind of these extra quantities, okay? So on a per element basis, you know, shell elements are, are computing but what you gain from this is that, you know, you gain a lot of cost back because you, you know, usually you're going to use shell elements in a, in a situation where, you know, if you were to use solid elements, it would require a lot, a lot of elements. Okay. okay. So that's what shell and deep elements are in a nutshell. And, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of the reason that we do this. So whenever you have geometries that have these thin or slender features, you know, it's always a good idea to consider shell and beam elements just because, you know, if you were to try to do it with solid elements, it would be challenging to say, to say the least. Okay, any questions on, on this? Okay. 
Okay. All right. Another another uh, issue that I want to bring up is the is the uh, is the kind of the issue of computing stresses and strains in these in these elements as well. Okay. So remember, stresses and strains is often something that we're very interested in computing in finite element simulations, especially structural simulations. Okay. But stresses and strains are, are not a primary quantity. Remember, so we call these derived quantities. Meaning that you know, in order to compute them, we have to take the derivative of our primary of variables, uh, and that and that primary variable is our deformation. Okay. All right. So that's not the initial. That's that's you know we've 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 talked about this at least twice before. Okay. All right. When you have uh, thin and slender geometries, you know this this can be an issue, right? And this kind of goes back to the issue of having more than one element through the thickness, or I say only one element. Uh, because you know when when you're taking derivatives, at least in a computational sense, um, derivatives are taken using a technique called finite differences. Um, and so, you know, I think I think some of you may may know what finite differences is. I think you know I think Dr. I think Dr. Banks uses it in his in his heat transfer course. But basically, the idea with finite differences is that you can compute derivatives based on the difference of uh, in quantity between neighboring nodes. So basically, you know, if you had if you had a mesh and you had an element that looks like this, so I'm just drawing one element here. If you wanted to compute the derivative, you know, in in one certain direction on this, basically you would take the solution at node one, one uh, minus the solution at d two, and you divide by the distance between them. So you let's say the distance is delta x, okay. So you take d1 minus d2 divided by delta x. This is your approximation for the derivative. And so underneath the hood, when ANSYS is computing things like stress and strain for you, it's computing derivatives just like this. Okay. So if you have a situation where you have a very thin or slender geometry, remember we talked about that, you know, if you were to use solid elements, the majority of your nodes are going to be sitting on the boundary. And so if your finite difference approximation is computed mostly using boundary nodes, um, it's going to, you know, lead to erroneous results. Okay. 
right? So remember what we said, boundary nodes, their, their values or their solutions are going to be determined basically by the boundary conditions that are set, okay? And so what we can say is that, you know, if these derivative quantities are computed mostly using the boundary nodes, then the boundary conditions, whatever boundary conditions that you're applying, are going to have a very strong influence on the stress calculations. Uh, and that's usually something that you don't want to, to do, okay? So one, one way that you can fix this is, you know, again, you can refine the hell out of your mesh so that you have a lot of interior nodes. And so the more interior nodes that you have, you know, the, the less this kind of has an effect, okay? Um, but of course, using shell and beam elements kind of gets gets around this issue as well. Okay. And so what we can say is that but shell and e shell and beam elements are much better at computing stresses in these in these kind of thin and slender geometries. Okay. The reason for that, if we kind of scroll back up here. Right. Remember that I mentioned that you know these shell elements are special, and that not only do they compute um, deformations in x and y directions, but they also compute rotations. Right. The rotation itself is actually already a derivative-based quantity. What's special about this is that you know. As opposed to your solid elements, you know, if you have a, a shell or a beam element, you know, you don't have to use finite differences to actually compute these derivative quantities. It just pops out just magically from the equations. Okay. Now it's it's a little bit hard for me to kind of illustrate that without going into the full derivation of the shell and beam equations, um, but uh, you know, we don't have time. We don't have time for that. Um, but you know, just the way that those equations are are kind of formulated and the way that they're um, solved. You know, you kind of get these derivative quantities automatically from the equation. So you don't have to do any kind of finite difference approximation at all. Okay. And so what that means is that, you know, if you use shell and beam elements in their kind of appropriate kind of uh, context, then your stress calculations, your strain calculations are going to be naturally a lot more accurate than if you try to use um, solid elements in that same context. So shell and beam elements compute rotations directly straight from their equations. And so stress calculations are a lot more accurate. So another good reason to use shell and beam elements. So basically, you know, kind of the upside to this is that, you know, if you're if you're really struggling to, to put, you know, a fair amount of interior nodes um, in your mesh, you know, maybe you can consider using a different type of, okay? And you can see this very, very clearly too, right? And so if you mesh your geometry um, and, and you kind of look at the side of the, of the geometry, if you only see kind of one element going through one dimension of your, of your part, you know, then maybe you can think about, you know, maybe I should, you know, turn this into a shell, 
uh, or maybe turn into a beam, and then you know I can get some better results. So. Okay, so hope, hopefully I've convinced you enough that mm -hmm. using shell and beam elements are um, very nice for a lot of situations. Um, but you know, at, but at the same time, you know, they can't be used for for every right. So it's not a you know they're not a um, a catch up. They're not a a, a great um, you know they're not better than solid elements. They are in some situations, but not in every situation. All right, any questions on, on this so far? Okay, so let's let's talk about those situations where shell and beam elements will be more uh, appropriate or, or better. Okay. So, you know, at this point, you know, I, I think we have kind of a qualitative understanding of when to use shell and beam elements. Basically, whenever your geometry looks like a shell or looks like a beam, okay? So that's kind of the qualitative um, kind of metric that you can use, right? So when it looks slender, it looks thin, right? That's that's when you should use uh, shells and beams. But you know, of course, we can't do this just based on qualitative stuff. Um, I mean, eventually you'll you'll kind of build the intuition in terms of you know what looks thin enough. But you know, let's let's put some numbers on this. Let's let's actually give it a Um It's hard it's hard to kind of put a hard threshold on this because everyone. Um, you know, if you ask, you know, 10 different FEA analysts, you know, they'll probably have 10 different opinions on, you know, when it's best to use shells and beams. Um, so I'm going to give you kind of an approximate kind of rule of thumb. Um, this is kind of my own rule of thumb. Um, so usually for me, when, when I think it's appropriate to use shell and beam elements is when one of the dimensions is one order of magnitude lower than the other dimensions in that same geometry. So one order of magnitude base uh, ten times smaller. So if I, if I were to draw this beam or this uh, this plate, it's like a fish on drawings today. And so if this dimension here is the is the depth, this dimension here is the width, this dimension here is the height. Okay. If the height were roughly about zero point one times the depth, or maybe zero point one times the width. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's when I would consider using shell. But, you know, again, this is not a hard cutoff, right? Um, you know, you're, you're not going to find this in any textbook, you know, no textbook will tell you kind of what a hard cutoff is, but, you know, I'm, I'm giving this to you just as kind of a, just to give you an idea, just to give you a sense of, uh, of when to use these things. But, you know, of course, this is not, you know, this is, this is not, this is not the end all be all number, right? And so if it's 0 0.11, that doesn't mean, you know, you should use solid elements, right? If it's 0 point, um, you know, um, two, you know, you could you could still use the, make the argument to make shells, but you know, I think this is kind of a good starting point. And then, kind of once you start to get used to it, then you'll um, you know you'll kind of build your own intuition. Okay. Any uh, any questions on on this? Yeah. So for projects, um, we ever encounter something like this? 
You could. Yeah. So I don't think it's a. I don't think you can apply shelves for for this midterm project. I haven't tried, um, but the uh, but the geometries are the, ge the geometries I gave you are actually they are actually quite thin. Um, but there are some complications with the practical application with three. Okay. Yeah. But I know some people that did it for their final project last year, um, and it, it did help them out quite. Well. Okay. All right. So that is kind of the theory, and that's kind of the, the motivation for using shells um, and beams. Um, so let's talk about practical application now. So how do you act? How do you actually use these elements? Because you know, if you if you go into ants right now and you kind of follow our same kind of you know methodology that we've been doing for the activities, um, there's no option to choose a shell type element. Uh, in fact, you know, maybe there might have been some people in the class right now that were searching through ants and, and they couldn't find it. Uh, that's because there's kind of a very special procedure to uh, to initiate kind of using shell and beam elements. So let's start with shells first. Okay, so shell elements, you know, shell elements, these are the element types that we are using to represent very thin geometry. Right, so one dimension or one thickness is very small compared to the right. There's basically kind of two routes that you can that you can do to kind of create shell elements. One of these routes is kind of rare unless you have kind of full control over the entire process um, and, and you're doing it just for FEA. Uh, but the second one is probably going to be more important. Okay, so the first route. The first route is to basically, um, you know, build up your CAD model from scratch, you know, using shell elements. So that means that if you're going to go if you're going to go route number one, then your CAD file itself is going to have you know basically two dimensional you know structures within within that that, uh, that CAD file. Okay. So there are two um, you know there are two there are two ways of doing this. Right. So both both method A and method B are going to be done directly within the CAD software itself, and so you kind of have you and so to use kind of path one. You kind of have to make a decision right from the beginning that you're going to use shell and you're going to use shell or beam elements. Okay. All right. So method A here, so or one A, I guess, is you can create a two D sketch. Okay. So that two D sketch can be a SolidWorks, it can be an Ansys design modeler, it can be an Ansys um, you know, space claim. Okay. And then from that two D sketch, you're you're not going to extrude it. Typically, you would you would do some kind of operation on a sketch to turn it into a three dimensional um, three dimensional kind of object, right? But if you're going to make it a shell, you basically just you create your two D sketch and then you assign it at that point to be a shell, okay? Right. And so that 2D sketch at that point is, is not going to you know, have any thickness to it. Um, it'll have an imaginary thickness that you're going to use for calculation, but it's not going to be extruded or anything. Right? That's basically what we did in activity one. Now, in activity one, we didn't do a true kind of shell simulation. We, we limited that whole simulation to be in two dimensions. But that's the same idea where you would draw a sketch, you would dimension it in two dimensions, and then you would you know, apply a certain filter. And then that 2D sketch becomes a shell mm -hmm. surface. Um, and if you create a shell surface in this way, then ANSYS will recognize it as such, 
and then you will be able to mesh it, um, you know, using shell elements. Okay. Okay. Method 1B. Method 1B is to create an open sketch in your CAD software. So you're going to create an open sketch, and then you're going to use a special kind of uh, extrusion or a special revolve uh, or special kind of operation to generate a three-dimensional planar surface. All right, so I'm, I'm not going to illustrate um, method 1A. Method 1A hopefully is a bit obvious, right? So you kind of just create a sketch and that becomes a shell, okay? For 1B, okay, let's say that, so an open sketch is basically a sketch that doesn't kind of close in on itself, right? So maybe you draw kind of a, a surface that looks like this, okay? So to turn this into a shell, basically you would extrude this kind of one dimensional line into the page. So if I were to extrude this, this, so you basically have kind of a thin sheet that you generated by extruding a one-dimensional line. Okay. All right. So method one B is, is really important if your if your if your uh, if your shell surface is going to come into and out of the page a lot, um, then you can use method one. All right, so this, these are probably the most flexible ways to create a shell surface. It's, it's also the most clean. Uh, and so if you have the power and, and, and you kind of know already uh, based on your, kind of your intuition that you want to use shells, then you can just incorporate it directly into the CAD you know, using you know, one A or one B here, okay? And that's probably the best way to do it if you have the, the, uh, the ability to do so. Uh, but a lot of times, you, know, you don't have the ability to do so you know, either the CAD, the CAD model is going to be used for, for something else. And so it needs to have thickness. It needs to have, um, um, you know, it needs to have some kind of uh, volume to it. Um, so maybe it can be used for rendering or it can be used for um, animations or, or, or something like that. Okay. Or what's even more common is that, you know, maybe you're receiving the CAD file from someone else and they did not include these, uh, these shell services. Okay. So method two Method two is to modify an existing um, CAD file, which does not have any shells um, to, you know, uh, to transform some parts of that into shell, shell parts. So it is it is possible to take an existing CAD file and, and transform it. It's just it just doesn't end up being as clean sometimes. Okay, it'll work out really nicely in, in, in some cases. And so the activity that we're going to do next week, relatively clean, although it's it's still there's still some kind of um you know messiness to it that you know you'll you'll see when we get there. Um, but in some in, for some geometries this works really well. But you know this this but path number two is not going to work out for all geometries. Okay, and so within this category, there are two kind of main methods that you can use it as well. Okay, so the first method, uh, we'll call it method 2A. This is probably the one that we're going to um, use the most. And so this is called a mid surface operation. And so what this does is that it, this is the idea behind a mid surface is to extract a shell surface 
from two very closely parallel surfaces within your 3D. And so if you have two surfaces that are very parallel to each other, that are very close, you know, that oftentimes is the case when you have thin features of your, of your geometry, then you can apply a mid surface. And basically what it does is that it creates a shell that's right in the middle of those two parallel, um, you know, parallel points. Okay. okay. So that's the one that we're primarily going to be using the most in, in the activity next week. Other, the other common option that you can use to create a shell is to use a tool called a thin slash surface tool. This one is this one is a little bit more niche. Um, it's uh, it's it's not as as prevalent. But basically the idea with, between this tool is to basically extract a shell um, from an otherwise kind of solid object. So you basically kind of, the way I like to think about it is that you kind of you kind of apply a coating of paint on whatever part that you have, and then you just extract. And then if the paint kind of hardened and kind of formed kind of very thin shell, that's that would be kind of your, uh, your shell surface. Right? So again, you know, not not too common, but you know there are there are situations that you can use that. Okay, and it's pretty cool when you can use it because it's like almost like you're kind of extracting kind of the, the exoskeleton of your of your object. Okay. If you're into insects or reptiles, it's like you know it's like your 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 part kind of shed its skin, and then that's, that's the skin that that are animals. Okay, so I want to I want to spend a bit more time on the mid surface. So you know I'm gonna I'm gonna um, kind of define that a bit more. And kind of give you an, an illustration of that. Uh, but are there any questions on on these on these methods here? Okay, good. Okay, so let's talk about let's talk about the mid surface a bit more. Okay, so the idea with the mid-surface operation, in order to use it, you have to identify two parallel surfaces in your model that are very closely, you know, located very close to each other. And so depending on your CAD model, depending on the situation, you know, you're probably going to have, you know, uh, for your thin surfaces, you know, you're basically going to, you're basically going to choose the two flat, large surfaces. Okay. okay. So as an example, right. So let me kind of illustrate this for you. So let's say that you have a portion in your uh, CAD model. It's like this. So you have you have a you have a um, geometry here that's that's relatively thin, okay. 
And if you look at these two surfaces, right? So one surface is going to be this one right here. So this is surface one, okay? Surface one is going to be parallel and very close to the surface behind it. So of course, you know, with the weakness of drawing three-dimensional objects in two dimensions, you know, you can't see what's behind it, right? Mm -hmm. But imagine that, that there's another surface, okay? Which is simply the other side of this plate, which is surface two, okay? So surface one and surface two are, are parallel to each other, and they're very, very close. So that's the first step when you do a mid surface. When you do a mid surface, it's going to ask them to click on two surfaces that are parallel to each other that are, that are kind of very close. Okay. And so if you select those two surfaces, you know, ANSYS will kind of do a little bit of, of calculation and then they'll say, yes, you know, these two surfaces are, um, you know, they're, they're eligible for doing a mid surface. Okay. So the idea is that, you know, if these two surfaces are, are close enough to each other, then they should be thin enough to replace with a shell. And that's exactly what uh, what ANSYS is going to do. It's going to take you know it's going to take your part here, which has two surfaces that are very parallel to each other. They're the exact same shape, and then we're going to replace it with a uh, the shell. Okay. And so what it does at that point is that it, it computes the distance in between, okay, and then it places a another surface that's right in the middle of of those two. And so it's literally kind of halfway in between the two um, the two planes, right? Okay. And so if 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 ANSYS is able to do this, and so it's able to kind of put a plane right in the middle, and it and it doesn't touch any of the other surfaces, then you can choose to execute the sh um, the mid surface then, okay? And so at this point, you know, ANSYS will kind of show you what it's going to do. So it's going to show you the two the two um, you know surfaces one and two um, that's going to delete. And that's going to show you the mid surface plane that's going to replace it. Okay. And so, if you were to go, if you were to go through with this uh, with this mid surface then uh, it would look something like this. So instead of having a three-dimensional um, surface, you would just have a thin sheet here that replaced. And so this thin sheet now is, this is now a shell. And when you go to ANSYS and, and mesh it, it'll be, it'll, be, it'll be meshed with kind of special shell elements. So, so mid surface is, is very uh, convenient for for some cases, and so for uh, geometries that have kind of very long parallel planes, planar surfaces, um, you can replace it with shells. Okay. Um, the caveat with using uh, mid surfaces, and 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 you know, um, I think the temptation with this is that you know, if you go back and do your project, you know, there are surfaces on there that look like they can be shells. Um, now, I haven't tested it, so I don't I don't know if it's going to work or not. But generally speaking. You know, a mid surface only works if the distance in between the two surfaces is constant throughout the entire mid surface operation. 
So if your two planes are kind of slightly, if they're tapered to some degree and the distance either grows or shrinks as, as you go along, uh, the mid surface isn't, isn't going to work, okay? Uh, another thing is that if you have curved surfaces or if your surface has any kind of surface features on it, uh, it's very hard to get kind of a constant thickness throughout. Um, if the CAD was made very well, then you know, maybe, maybe it is. Um, but oftentimes, you know, is, is if your planes aren't, if your mid surface planes aren't completely flat, and they aren't completely parallel to each other, then the mid surface will probably struggle and, and you may not be able to do it. Uh, or kind of the worst, uh, kind of the worst case is that, you know, maybe you attempt a mid surface and then ANSYS will get rid of a lot of kind of geometric features of your model for you. So I've, I've, I've seen that happen. Okay. Yeah, question. Can we stitch like what else together? Um, yeah, in theory you can. Yeah, so uh, so uh, that's that's that kind of gets into kind of more advanced stuff where you know you create you know different shell surfaces and then you kind of you know, stitch stitch them together to be a certain way. I think that's that's typically what people do. That if you have a thin surface with some surface features, mm -hmm. then people basically create different shells and different patches and then stitch stitch them together. Yeah. We're not going to do that in this class, but yeah, it's def definitely possible. Any questions on, on this? Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna stop here for today because I, I don't want to get into beams until until next time. But we'll uh, we'll cover beams uh, first thing on Tuesday. Um, so uh, so thank you guys for coming today. I uh, hope you guys have a good weekend, uh, and I will see you guys next. Yeah. Week. Yeah, I'm going to be on the Oh, you want to study for us? Uh, no, I'm not studying. Uh, are you guessing? Like, cool, huh? Uh, I'm studying Monday, yes? Yeah. Study okay. after class. Oh, so you're just yeah, I'm studying. I'm still getting the cheat sheet. I'm going to put it. I'm going to put it. You don't get me like a new website. Hence for what you're talking about. I'm just like, I don't need to touch it. Oh, okay. It doesn't actually do it. I'm going to look at this. I see what it is. It's not that bad. If you can get 100% on this. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh,